Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me. Uh, been in the berry business now for 40 years, and 30 years I've been an actual full-time guy in it. And uh, for 15 years I've been doing all the sales and marketing at Norse Farms. And last year I uh, I went away from the company, started my own thing. Uh, so I'll talk about what we were doing, but that's what they're doing now, and it's interesting to watch all these big growers like Pearson's talking about out in California. I was out there in 88 to 93 and to watch that progression of uh, what they've done, we've tried to m manage that here on the East Coast. And what's most interesting is, is since early 2000, California has adopted this <coughs> plastic um, high tunnel system where they have the best growing conditions in the entire United States, barely four or five inches of rain in the entire year. So you think about that, they have the least rain but they're doing the most tunnels. And why is that? Because it's the most profitable. So we've changed, tried to take our thinking away from, oh this thing is a big expense to it's a big investment into being more profitable. And what these guys were just talking about is, is that we have to do more with less, we have to be more productive with what we have, and these systems lend that very well to what we're trying to do. So um, at Nurse Farms, I had the Haygrove guy come out in 2003, and I was all gung-ho to get that first high tunnel in, and it wasn't until 2014, we were actually in business 10 years later with our first high tunnel. So it took a long time to get somebody to write a check to get that first tunnel structure in. And then that was a big mistake and was going to be a downfall of the farm until 2017, two years later, they realized how profitable it was that they decided to do another two acres. So. Being an early adopter sometimes is difficult, but paying attention to what the, these guys are doing, you realize that this is really the future. So I'm trying to help you understand that this is going to be more fun in the, in the end than what you might be doing now. And what's really interesting is, is in the Cornell Guide, they talk about here in the Northeast, we have the most advantage to win with a tunnel system, but we've been the least adoptive to the new technology. So I'm going to try and help you understand why it works and why this investment really does pay off. And it basically comes down to two to three times of production in the same square foot area. So why, why should we do this? Because it's profitable we get a longer season, we have organic friendly things that we can do, and we do see lower spotted wing drosophila pressure. We, we see it as an investment and we have realized every benefit that the sales guy has uh, tried to sell us. And when you take the new technology, using the new insect netting as exclusion, that adds another layer to it so all you organic guys can grow fall raspberries under this netting and have zero spray and realize that the two to three time production increase as well. So there's all these benefits that we're seeing. It's not a bunch of smoke and mirrors. So when you look at the economics of it, 75 cents per square foot for a three season tunnel, so we're going to take the plastic down in the winter time. We're going to um, put up the plastic early in the spring after the last threat of, of snow, which is probably around this time down in this area. Massachusetts probably going to be the third week of April. Um, and then we're going to remove the plastic before it snows. Uh, in November, so sometime after uh, Halloween, we're going to pull it down. And, and what we realized is from even though we had this extended season and we had all these beautiful berries from mid October 
to uh, Halloween, the sales were very difficult because our farmers market guys were slowing down, the people weren't coming out, it, it, it just, so you think you're going to go to uh, maybe even Thanksgiving with this, you might do it on half your half of what you think. So don't be thinking that you're going to go to Christmas with, a, with your full acreage is, is kind of the message there. Um, versus a four season tunnel, that's what the USDA is selling you. I think for a lot of small farmers, this is a great way to get started. They pay for half your tunnel and it really lends itself well, again, to the insect netting because it's a stronger structure that can hold that up. And there's people using plastic on the top and then the insect netting on the sides and the end walls. There's different ways you can manage that. But the, the insect netting is a big part of what makes it really work. And Dale Riggs up at the up in New York, she's the president of the New York State Berry Growers and she's done a lot of work with this. And there's plenty to see online about what she's doing. And she was ready to get out of the raspberry business. And now with blueberries and raspberries netted, she's got no insecticides, she's got higher sales, and she's very profitable with what she's doing. Um, with the with the four season tunnel, I see some issues with plant dormancy, so you want to make sure that you vent these things and keep them open in the winter time so you don't get growth. I'm out with Dr. Raffi at the at the field the other day and you can see the raspberries starting to grow and if it gets below 25 with that growth, you're gonna kill it and it's gonna be tough to come back. You're gonna lose a couple of weeks. So we want to make sure we keep them dormant in the winter and then if it gets really super cold uh, below zero maybe we would close them or during a snow event we might close it to keep some of the snow from blowing in but basically keeping that four season tunnel open during the year um, we want to look down here that it's so warm that you will, you have to have the luminance plastic the diffuse light plastic to keep it cooler you're going to need some shade and clear plastic it's a little bit cheaper but it's not going to work for the berries so uh, you got to look at the diffuse light plastic and probably even some shade for one or two months in in june and july and some august to get through the season um, so we have a at, at norris farms they built uh, the 24-foot bay, it takes a wind better than the 30-foot structure. We put three rows in there, eight foot apart, and you're going to have irrigation, and I think if I was going to do it fresh, I would have the two lines of irrigation instead of just the one. Uh, it, it's hard to, you know, the, the root system goes six to eight feet across the row, and with one single line, you're barely getting two feet covered and with the double line I think you're going to get four to six feet with that so I would go to double line there and with our specialized spray equipment a lot of guys in the small town are going to use a backpack but we we bought this little John Deere orchard tractor it's four feet wide and the and it's and it's 90 horsepower it's a nice little unit and it pulls that sprayer behind it with the two prop tech heads and we're getting fantastic coverage with that. And you're gonna be a little bit bigger operation. You gotta probably have two or three acres to probably justify that. But right next to it here in the, in the bottom is what we were using, that little 50 gallon pack tank. And that works good too. And we had a specialized boom that went up and over the side row so we could cover that outside row. That's probably the trickiest part of growing in the tunnel. And then um, we'll go through the varieties, the production system, and hopefully have enough time for the soilless. And we do have some slides here that are going to repeat of what some other people have talked about, so I'll kind of run over that quickly. But if there's something that's really bugging you, please put your hand up because I want to make sure that you understand these systems. Um, every variety has its personality and guys at the same table. <coughs> We'll, we'll argue all day long that their variety is better than yours and I'm here to help you understand that if you make a few minor changes 
that maybe that other guy's variety is as good or better than what you have. And what we've recognized is, is doing a few small changes in pruning and cultural practices with cover crops and setting up the soil a little better, we've gotten more bigger berries. And when you all talk about labor, it's all about getting it done in the most economical way and make the most money. This is what it lends itself to, is more bigger berries are faster to pick than little ones. Um, these older varieties will respond to this pruning and we're also seeing improved winter hardiness and of all the mistakes that we've made over the years this is one that really paid off the guys started pruning the raspberries they cut the blackberries and the black raspberries and the red res raspberries back in October and there's like extension told us never to do that we're gonna be in big trouble well we had a minus 18 to minus 20 degree wet winter event and all of our blackberries and black raspberries survived the winter. We've realized for over 10 years that pruning the laterals back in late November, early December will gain you 30 to 50 percent winter hardiness. And I would never go back to the old ways. And getting these raspberries topped is a big deal. So new premise. Pruning is not an expense. We're going to have uh, primocanes and floricanes have to be trellised because we can pick through the berries faster. We're, um, the goal is to maximize production by variety. We're going to have better air drainage, so we're going to have less anthracnose on the canes. We're going to have minimum disease pressure with botrytis, and even better, we're going to have better SWD control because we have less habitat for them to hang out in. And then the newest thing that we're, I've kind of developed here is what I call a commercial everbearer. This is where we're going to pick two times a year a marketable fruit off the same row. So we're going to pick 50% more berries than if we mowed them off. So I'm, I'm, so what I'm saying is when people go and mow off their fall primocane raspberries instead of trying to get the second crop off the following spring, they're throwing away 30 to 50 percent of a potential crop off that same row. So we're going to get two marketable crops per year off the primocane that we normally call an everbearer and the floricane that makes it through that we're going to top the primocane get it through the winter and I'm going to show you the varieties that are going to do that most of them are going to do that down here the permanent trellis makes it easier to have everything cookie cutter and it, it just helps uh, I should say with the pruning guys because with the trellis clips you unclip the one cane and they put the next cane right in its spot so they don't have to think about Oh gee, how many? They just match them right up. Um, so that's faster to do. We're gonna get the old canes out as soon as you're done picking, and this is big for SWD control as well as disease control because we're gonna eliminate, you know, reduce the amount of anthracnose because we don't have that big thicket all fall. And then we, when we attach to the to the trellis. It just lines everything up and we can support this huge crop load that we have because bigger berries are going to bend over those canes faster. And then the last thing is we top the canes in November, we'll go through that. The, the new part of this that makes it so efficient and, and lends itself as this all the way through is that when we thin the canes in late April down here, early May, as they get to be 8 to 12 inches tall, we're going to cut out about half of what's coming up so we have six or eight canes per foot a row. So the guys are going to match up a cane right next to the existing one and maybe have one or two extra per foot a row. When it's this height, it's faster to do. And we did the work in May or early April when it isn't quite as busy as it is in July, right? Um, and then 
the, the trickle down effect of that is, is that because there's less canes, there's less competition. So the six to eight canes that you leave grow bigger, faster, and earlier produce with bigger berries. So there's this, again, a follow through with this that you get bigger berries because you thin them out and spent the time early. And then the last thing is nothing like selling bigger berries because that's what everybody wants in the market. And then again, we're gonna remove the canes as soon as we're done picking. We're gonna put the, those new prime canes that we thinned in the spring in the spot where they were, detach the clip, old cane comes out, new cane comes in. Guys are trying to snake the cane under the wire and get it on the inside. I says, whoa, it's harder to pull that out. So we just use that nice little clip, and I'll show you that next. We clip it to the wire on the outside so it comes out easier. That's what the clip's for. You don't need it on the inside anymore because we're clipping them. And then you'll see what the SWD is, is, is way lower. So you can go online to nursefarms.com in the commercial growers section. There's a reference library with all the pruning information that I wrote down for you. But you know, you remember this, and maybe some of you guys are still doing this, is that you go out right before you start picking and you start to thin a little bit. Well, look at, think about all the SWD that can be in there, in that big thicket. And then, again, the disease pressure versus this. How can the SWD hang out in the bottom if there's no canopy for them? And so we, and the control that we get is just marvelous. And you can see those are topped, so they're all set to go. And then you see in the bottom, when the primocanes start coming up in the spring, those are the ones that we're gonna thin out and match them up to the canes that are there. This is a trellis growing system, V trellis. Uh, there's all sorts of ways to do this. And in the high tunnel, you can see you got three or four rows. This might be a little close, this is an older picture, but I want to have at least eight feet between the rows. And then when we attach them with that clip, you can see it, it really holds it nice in place and they don't get blown around in the wind and we can carry a heck of a load on that wire. And then this, of top in the canes in November, that's where basically you had the primocane, you picked the top foot, so we want to get these things up to about six, six and a half feet tall, and we're going to cut them off right here about head height, or chest height, excuse me, so that you just left four to six inches above the trellis wire. Even though that there might have been fruiting spurs above that that you're not going to get, you're still going to get another 20 inches below that to about 30 inches that you're going to fruit the following year. So. With these new varieties, if you don't thin them, you don't get the same production as if you don't. And, and that's what we're going to talk about next. But we have to thin them to get these big berries. So once we've done all that work, all we have to do is walk down the row with a weed uh, whacker with a sickle bar on it and top that thing, and that gets us our spring crop. We've done all the work to get the spring crop. It's all lined up. And what this did was it reduced our winter injury way up north. And down here, you're not going to have that as much. But by having this uh, stronger cane, these fluctuations and such, you're going to have something to make it through the winter to pick the following spring, probably 95% of the time. And when, again, blackberries and black raspberries, you need to take those laterals back. So I'm seeing three or four buds get through the um, winter with less plant and less winter damage. And that's what these would look like uh, in the fall right before you start picking. Uh, this happens to be a, a row of Encore that we wouldn't pick, but and, and then they come through and hedge them off. And the guy just walking down the road clips them off. It's not a big job. Uh, here are the varieties for the double crop potential in the field or in the tunnel. The prelude has been fantastic for us. You get such an early spring crop, and then you get this later fall crop that helps supplement. As it gets cooler, you got more 
uh, to pick so you keep your production levels pretty even through the fall. The Nova, the same thing, uh, midsummer and a late fall production. If you're having trouble growing raspberries, Nova is a firmer berry for you. It's going to be more like not to haul. It's going to take the heat a little better. It's, it's going to be easier to get to market. And if you're inexperienced, uh, Prelude and Nova are a good one to get started. And the next one, Polka, is probably the easiest one to grow in the fall because it's firm. And that's the one I would always ship to uh, Whole Foods. We can get four to five days shelf life, no problem with this. Um, and, and what's interesting is I saw polka up in Quebec two years ago and in these grow bags it was bigger than what we had in the field. He says, what are we doing wrong? We think we know what we're doing. We've been doing this for 40 years. What's wrong with us? Well, they're managing them really well. And if you think you're doing okay, when you have thumb size polka, then you know you're doing it perfect. Um, Joan Jay, we're going to argue about how dark they are. But you can pick them every day, and it isn't that much more expensive. I thought it was going to be 15% more, maybe 20% more labor. It's 5% more because you pick more berries into the tray over the entire week. Our, we, would, we would have the cull buckets out there because of the fall SWD thing. Our cull buckets went in half when we pick every day. So you're not throwing that away or selling that for three bucks a pound. We're selling that for five to six dollars a pound so um, and and if you're and if you're organic and you don't want to spray a thing there's a lady up here in Vineland that will pick all of her berries with no spray and she picks every day pink pulls it off and puts it in a basket and she's getting 42 bucks a crate so himbo top lends itself even better to that it pulls off almost white I wouldn't recommend that, but with uh, the super winter hardiness it has and the Phytophthora root rot resistance, if you're still planting in the ground, that one will grow where no other will. And it's a, and it's a decent tasting berry and you have to treat it different because uh, you have to probably feed that one 30 to 50% less than your other raspberries. People talk about himbo top being too soft they're overfeeding it. And they're what a proper raspberry cane should look like. There should be three or four branches on the top of that thing with three or four baskets. And this is why we prune these things and thin them because if we don't, we get one little spindly thing like we used to get with Heritage with a few berries up on the top. This thing is three times more productive than Heritage and a beautiful crop of berries. And Joan Jay does the same thing. I, I call it a Christmas tree, Joan Jay, because of the branching on it. Um, no, that's Himbo Top, or jo I think that's Himbo Top. And the new ones, the Amira Quelle Kwanzaa, put this one to shame. So um, it's about getting this thin proper. If you're not thinning, you're not going to get this result. And then the newest varieties, Amara, Quelle, and Kwanzaa, I'm from the North Country, and these things come in really too late for most of the northern growers, but for you guys, I think these have the most potential. So you're getting a variety in coming in at the same time as Josephine. The Amira is obviously the easiest to grow. We've had everybody from Michigan down here to have positive results with Amira. Um, it's an earliest of the three. And now that we understand what Amira's doing, we can figure out what you need to do to tweak Quelli and Kwanzaa's growth to make it right. Quelli is the driest raspberry I've ever eaten. And uh, there's some guys here talking about how it could be crumbly. I think if it's crumbly, we gotta look at the water, maybe 20 to 30% more. We have to look at what we're feeding it because all of these plants should be at least head height and a little bit more so, right? If they're at that six to six and a half feet, you nailed it. If you're at seven, maybe you're a little aggressive, but if you're at five, you're definitely not where these, these plants need to be. 
and that's with all the varieties. They, if, if you're not at this five and a half, six feet height, we need to tweak what you're doing just a little bit. Even Joan Jay? Even Joan Jay. Okay. So what's really interesting is the Tunnelberries, Michigan, they did all this work this last year, and you go online and see. And the first thing I want to point out is this is the summer production on all the varieties and they're whatever that unit is so if you're mowing it off you just threw all that production away and I say that production is worth two to three times of what the labor it is to get that okay and to get this production a Myra for most growers is going to be the least productive of the three and you see this is a Myra and this is Prelude right behind it. Coeli and Kwanzaa didn't do very well. They need to adjust what they're doing a little bit because the Myra, the red line and the Kwanzaa, excuse me, the Kwanzaa and the Coeli, the blue and the red line there should be above this significantly so we're going to work on that but the point is is that they still got a massive production increase versus the other varieties like here's Josephine way down here and some of the others so they're they're really exciting new varieties and then there's the the new Cornell guide they have the new update for 2017 and I'll just say that black and gold raspberries work really well in the tunnel too. Um, I think blackberries are too complicated for tunnels. Um, everything's picked in half pints and we got a two quart butter bucket. And this is what it looks like on the week of the 4th of July to the third week of July. And you can see this lady here, she's got her bucket with her, her name on it and they can there's a bucket boy that takes that bucket back to the trailer and they pack them out in the trailer. Now this is a strawberry field but you can see here the, the picture of the trailer so we have the shading that Penny was talking about that we should have. There's uh, badges there so they're knocking everybody's, they're punching the bu button so that's all electronically fed and by going to that electronic system we saved a, about four days worth of work. Um, so we're taking an hour a day instead of four. Uh, there's crew guys out there, so you see the two guys, there's two or three guys on the trailer that are taking the berries in. We got boxes here, empties, we got all their water. We got a crew guy right here that's making sure that they're picking right. So we have at least four or five support guys. Is that right? Here we go. That, with strawberries, raspberries, blueberries, whatever, that's the... That, yeah, that's strawberries. That's out in the strawberry field. And with strawberries, we're picking directly into the eight quart flats. We're not transferring any quarts anymore. The, the buy-in from the crew is we're going to give you 100% effort. So with strawberries, you might find one or two bad ones in a basket, maybe. And with raspberries in that bucket, that's going to fill up a half pint flat. The maximum is 20 bad berries on a real rough day. On a good day, they're going to have five or 10 bad berries. And when those guys go and grade them a second time into the half pints, we have zero to one or two off berries in a basket. So it, by elevating that, we've, we've created this, how should I say, they're so perfect that we're competing against Driscoll and Whole Foods. And we're at $36 direct to Whole Foods and Driscoll Organic is 29. So, and it's working. And we're moving about 150 flats a week to Whole Foods. So it, it can work if you get the buy-in from the crew and everybody down the line, including your, your buyers. So it's not about I can go get them from California cheaper. Well, when the guy tells me that, I says, well, go get them. And your customer isn't going to be as happy because they taste like the back of the truck instead of the <laughs> right off the vine. Um, and then what's neat is with the tunnels, you can determine the harvest. So in the morning, it's starting to rain. We're out in the tunnel. We're picking 100% tunnels as fast as I can. 
and uh, it, it it's it's fun to manage this thing that way and I'll just kind of skip through that um, and then uh, as far as your fungicide and insecticide all I'm going to say is be proactive and get at least one or two applications on every month even you organic guys because there's things that you can use that you, sh you need to be using proactively especially organic um, they, they talk in the, in the uh, tunnel berries, they talk about uh, residue buildup because of the, the certain plastics and the shading that you don't get the same, uh, you can get residue build up higher because it's protected from the sun. If you're making more, if you're making applications every five to six days, you're going to have some residue issues after about five weeks. So be careful, keep, be cognizant of that. Your pesticides under the tunnel last longer because it's not getting wet and the difference is significant. So be, be aware of that, that in the tunnel that you're gonna spray on a seven day schedule at the most. Um, the other thing I'll say is we've been controlling the dust on the roads more than we've ever done and with the dust down, we have the least amount of speck ever and we have the least amount of orange rust or late rust ever. So that's a real important thing to keep in mind. And then there's some residue stuff that you can see on the tunnel berries thing. Um, the SWD, if you're picking every other day, we clean up on Saturday and we have Sunday off, no matter what. Then we have this window to spray insecticide as soon as we're done picking on Saturday through Sunday night so we can use a 12 or 24 hour material, but we're spraying on that every seven days. And then if you're having trouble with SWD, you can turn it all around by just picking every day. There's a way to reset. You pick it all off, you throw that away, and you pick every day after that. You can reset the button with SWD. I don't care how bad it is. Pick every day and get through a few weeks, and as soon as it cools off in September, you're back to every other day again. But the the daily harvest really works. And then I, I want to talk a little bit about this, this potted stuff. We, I was working with uh, Dr. Raffi and having the one to two primocanes per pot is something that we're trying to develop. I think the one per, per pot is the way to go and to have two lines of uh, pots in a row so that you got one cane on your tea trellis on each side right across from each other and it, it's, it's going to be really nice. We're, we saw it in the, in the parking lot, our greenhouse growers growing these things and they look better than they did in the field. Um, and we're good on a, on a heavy Virginia clay soil where you're struggling to grow raspberries. You just eliminated all that phytophthora issues by putting them in a pot. You're not working the ground anymore. And as long as you have good drainage, it's even better. And when you add the tunnel, you're just going to add more production numbers. This is a picture of what Penn State's doing, but you see all the plants in there are in bags. Those are the new potted bags. And then at Nurse Farms, you got two acres of tunnels up there on the top. You got your open field production here. And then you got the parking lot berries and pots. Okay? And you say, wow, these were bigger and nicer the entire season where we had struggled in 2016 with the drought and one single drip line. The berries kept getting smaller and the production kept getting less and the ones here in the parking lot were, were good. So it's not harder to grow in pots, it's probably easier. And when you take out the cover crop factor and the work in the ground thing, it really makes a lot of sense. The, probably the trickiest thing is figuring out the trellis and a lot of guys are, might go to pot and pot where you got half the pot buried in the ground. Heavier ground, I want it up a little bit because we're gonna have a puddle issue with those pot and pot things that would be my most concern maybe put a piece of lay some tile out under the row to get
get the drainage. But we've seen this with blueberries and other things with pot and pot. You have a puddle, and if the raspberries is in that puddle, they're, they're not going to do very well. But, you know, there it is on the side, early spring. You got these things, they're up about two and a half, three feet. You have a, a drip line going down the middle with a spaghetti and a pot sticker right in each pot. You got no weeding the entire year. How old are they? Those, uh, were, those are planted in the greenhouse sometime in late March, early April. And that's uh, like first week of May. So that's the other thing. There's other options that you can do to bring these things on earlier or have them be later. We're going to harvest berries right there. How about that? So on the worst piece of ground you got on the farm, we can grow raspberries like they were the best piece of ground on the whole farm. What do you mean by pot and pot? So pot and pot means they dig a hole in the ground, put a pot inside of it, and they just put the other pot and sleeve it. So, so you can pull it out in the winter time because I'm going to get to that part is you have to lay these over in the winter. I like that idea too much. There, there's this one small disadvantage with the hole being a bucket. Okay, and it rains a lot. What's going to happen in that hole on heavy clay ground? Is it going to be a bucket of water for a week or too many days? Because 24 hours the plant's dead. But we still have the soil underneath. So what I'm saying is maybe you had a tile drainage in the row that took that away, but maybe you didn't have it quite so deep. Or like here, there, we we're going to work harder at the trellis system and have a real strong trellis to support it. Well, there's again. I don't know the perfect answer, but I'm trying to tell you the worst things that can happen if you do something else. Yes, sir? Uh, that system there, you got that a tile underneath those pots there for all the water to, to filter in? So, no, underneath what they did, that, oops, sorry. So what they did underneath was he took a 200 uh, count cell tray and laid it out so that it's above the ground. We got a root pruning effect so that the roots aren't growing into the into the parking lot, right? And this is for an, an, another reason they're doing this is to have the roots. They take the roots out of that pot, lay them out on a greenhouse, and and the suckers pop up and they cut the shoots and make more plants. That's a production thing. So we're trying to keep them up off the ground for a nematode nursery thing. But the the point is, is that you can do this anywhere really inexpensively and have a really nice plant in a berries. Those are three gallon. And most everything you'll see is, they call it 10 liter or three gallon size pot. So we can double crop with these still. We doing good on time, Rafi? Okay. We're going to work through this a little fast, but we can still do a double crop and we can be even earlier because we can pull these things out. Those pots are warmer faster in the spring, so you're getting at least a week or 10 days earlier than in the ground. And then we can use all these other varieties that you didn't even think you could. So up in Quebec, they're using tulamine, which barely makes it through the winter down here sometimes. And tulamine is a heck of a summer producer. And then you can take those things in the fall and put them in a cold storage and, and leave them in the cold storage until late May. And that production window that you don't have many raspberries between late July and early August, all of a sudden you got raspberries like nobody else. So we can do a lot of different things in the pots that we can't do in the field. And we don't need to rotate crops. We don't, if we have a soil issue and, and there's some phytophthora issues in the, in the bag or in the pot, we just throw the pot away and put a fresh one in with a fresh plant. We're going to get four or five years out of them, maybe six. And the neatest thing, see that? Instant organic certification. You don't have, have to wait anymore because all your media, everything is instant. 
organic. And, and maybe in some cases, because the plant wasn't certified, you had to wait to the next season that it was certified organic. But you could tell your customer that I grew this organic, except for the, the plant wasn't certified. And they're not going to worry about that because it's already 90 days in the ground in your organic soil, right? So this is the complicated thing. Don't make it more complicated by trying to make your own. That's, it's, I think it's option one or option two. Make your own is not an option. But the Pro Mix is really easy. It holds good water. You can buy Pro Mix that has a little compost in it. You can buy Pro Mix that has a little more bark in it to have a little bit more water holding capacity. And we're only watering a couple times a day. The Quar is the newest thing and it, it, it's less disease. So if you're trying to grow a variety that had more phytophthora issues, I'd go there. But we have high salt issues and um, I don't know how you, you solve that, but I think lime sulfur can help you do that. In California, they use lime sulfur to pull the salts down through the profile. Lime sulfur before you plant in the pots would help bring some of that salt out. Um, making your own, the mix is never consistent. It's hard to get it right. You got to make sure that it's fully composted, fully finished compost. And it's just, in my opinion, don't go there until you're doing lots and you know exactly what you're doing and, and it's 100%. Um, the water management, there's people doing 10 and 15 irrigations a day. In some rare cases, you might be doing five to 10, but um, I don't think you have to, you, I don't think you have to make it more complicated than that. But the most important thing is watch your water pH because when you're uh, fertigating with that, you can really, uh, it can, it, the nutrients aren't taken up the same when the pH is high. And we're gonna wrap it up here, uh, lower all in, inputs and uh, there's something that looks pretty nice in the greenhouse early. And then again, one or two primocanes. And this is what it looks like up in Quebec where they lay it over and put that row cover. You can put a tarp in there. There's all sorts of ways to manage that. And then in May, you just bring them out, stand them back up, and off you go. Okay, Rafa. This is the part of single stem. Uh, it's the, we, we, we've got some of this uh, planting material from north. Uh, Imara, Kuali, and Kwanza in 2016. And we had them in one gallon pots in 2017. We kind of transplanted them in three gallon pots. And um, in April, and we started picking raspberry in in July. This is some of the information that we used during the, the course of the production season and we started picking in July. So um, I have that picture taken actually yesterday because I didn't take a picture when it started at single stem. By all means, that means one stem. We prune everything else out in those three gallon pots and those two other pictures are as they grow and start producing. Uh, the quality of the fruit is just really, particularly in our experience with Yamara, was, was really, really nice. Uh, this is a graph that we, we started looking at. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, the grams for 10 uh, pots. We had 10 pots uh, for each variety, 10 pots for Yamara, 10 pots for Kuali, and 10 pots uh, for Kawansa. Uh, the blue is the Imara that started in July, first week of July. Those are July 1, 2, those are weekly data. And then we finished by uh, for last week of, in fact, I have some data also in December. But uh, definitely in our case, Imara was, uh, was on the top. Uh, this is Imara quality in terms of the production. It was uh, Imara, again, go back and remember, we're dealing with single stem. 
We are not dealing with four canes as traditionally we do in the taller outside uh, with, uh, with, with raspberry. I had single stem, it's really easy to manage it in those pots that are three gallon pots. And then I was in California three, two, three weeks ago. The entire berry production is going under potted potted raspberry, potted blueberry. We saw miles of, I was selling Joey and Jeff yesterday, there are miles of high tunnel production of blueberry all in pots. They're completely managing in terms of the water and the nutrient and all in, uh, just in, incredible what they're doing. But anyway, so we are excited about it. I did this, didn't know what to expect, but uh, the result is really interesting, giving us close to four pounds during the production season from July to and November. Again, remember we have this is double cropping. We don't we don't have double cropping with this system. It's only one single crop, which is a primer cane, and then we get rid of it, and then we start all over again, all in pots. Uh, also, this this is the food size for uh, uh, the average of food size that we took during the production season. This is the size the f average food size for ten fruits. And the size of this is really, really a good size, a good size, good size fruit. But again, I, when we started this, I didn't know what to expect. We just decided to do it. But hopefully the result is really promising and we want to go ahead and hopefully take it to the next level this 2000, 2018.